How many school of ministry students do we have here? What a week. I'm telling you, I feel so good. God has been so good. We've learned so much in school just this first week. God, if you continue to do this every week, we'll be dead. <laughs> it's been so strong, and we just realized the promises of God are yes and amen, and they reign forever. Hallelujah. You ready to worship?
Come on, shout to the Lord. Shout to him. Yes, Lord. I hear Lindo and those guys come up here all the time and say, on Sunday morning, let's break that religion. And when I, I grew up in the Methodist church, I knew what it was about. I knew exactly what it was about. Never knew the Holy Spirit. And right now, I just want us to shake all that off right now. Let's just, we're a family. This is us. Let's worship the Lord together. Hallelujah. And what he's done for me when I think of his goodness and how it set me free. I
Bill's report, will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Oh, see. Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. His report says I am filled. His report says I am healed. His report says I His report says victory.
news report says I'm filled with your glory. His report says I am healed. His report says I've been set free. His report it says nothing but victory.
praise you, Lord. Lord, I love you. I praise you, Lord. We lift you, Lord. We lift you high, Lord. I want to be wrapped in your arms of love. Worship you. Praise you. But, but worship is for God's benefit. And so this next song, the last one we're going to do before we change the order of the service, I want you just to lose yourself in, in worship to the Lord. Just love Him and let Him love you. Open your heart. God wants to do something right now in our midst. And if we'll just open our hearts and receive from Him, God will pour His Spirit out in a tremendous way. You can be healed. You can be filled with the Spirit. You can be blessed beyond your wildest imagination. Right where you stand right now, because God is in this place, and when we begin to relate to Him on this intimate level called worship, God is able to do things in our lives that He's not otherwise able to do. So lift your voices and your hands and your heart to God as we, we worship Him in this last and praise Him in this last sermon.
Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you so much, Mike and worship team. God bless you. Before you're seated, and before we change the, into another line of uh, worship and praise in the service, most of you were shocked as we were when we got home last night, and um, I had a copy of the hard copy portion of uh, the report on the Brownsville Revival, and I wanted to, to get, it, uh, get home and see that uh, last night, and so my wife and I, we got there and hurriedly changed out of our church clothes and, and flipped the television on in preparation for putting that um, segment of hard copy on that covered the revival, and, and to our utter shock and dismay, we heard that uh, Princess Diana of England uh, was tragically killed along with um, uh, two other people and perhaps a, a, a fourth person um, in uh, France. Just a few months ago, Shirley and I were right in that area where that accident happened. Little did we realize when we were driving through those streets in the wee hours of the morning with a, a person from the church where we were ministering over there, uh, little did we realize the tragedy that would occur there in just a, a few short months after that. And, um, you know, so many times we look at those who are in privileged positions and we think that they're aloof and they're above the, the things of life that touch all the rest of us. But I want to tell you there's, there's hurt and there's pain in the heart of the royalty of England today because a heart can be grieved whether it's in a palace or in a hovel. And um, so there's a great deal of grief going on in the, the royal family in England today, especially my heart goes out to the children that she left. And um, there's, a, there's a gentleman from this congregation uh, who is a friend of Princess Diana's family. And uh, he'll be leaving, I believe, today. And he'll be going to England to minister to them. This, this person is a spirit-filled person that knows God. And what a comfort he can be to that family at this particular time of loss and bereavement. And so I want to take just a moment right now to pray for that gentleman that God will bless him and that God will, en will enable him and God would give him the wisdom he needs to be able to minister to that family and perhaps to bring them, if they don't know God, to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So would you just bow your hearts with me right now and let's just pray for this gentleman. We've already prayed for the family and I hope you'll continue to pray for them because this is going to be a very difficult and tragic thing uh, for days and weeks to come. But let's just pray right now for this gentleman as he goes to minister. Father, we lift our brother up. We don't even know his name. But you do, Lord, and you prepared this man for this moment in history because you knew all the time, Lord, that this was going to happen. And God, through the things that you've done in this man's life and through his life, through his salvation, through your filling him with your Holy Spirit, through the connection that he has with uh, uh, Princess Diana's family. Lord God, you've arranged all of that and prearranged it for such a time as this. And Lord, I pray that as this gentleman goes, that a special and unique unction will be upon his life, that he will be able to uh, break through that curtain of grief and that, that terrible black, blackness that's over that family right now. And Lord, I pray that you would help him to bring the light of your love and the light of your son's gracious goodness um, into that family and into this situation. And oh God, I pray that you would take something that Satan meant for evil and you would turn it to good. Father, in the name of Jesus, do this great thing for your glory, Lord, and the good of those uh, that have suffered such great loss. Father, we thank you because you do all things well, Lord, and you're arranging matters. We may think things are out of control, but, Lord, you have your hand on everything, and we thank you for that today. And so, Lord, we just commit this brother into your hand, and we commission him, and we ask you, O oh God, to let him be an instrument, an instrument in your hand, Lord. And let him do that that needs to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it's a joy to see you today. We welcome all of those of you who are in the chapel. We apologize that we don't have room for all of you here. God is blessing us and 
Maybe at some point in the future down the road, God will bless us with a facility so that we can all be under one roof. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, God can do that. And um, so we, we just welcome you, and we want you to feel as much at home and as much a part of what's going on here in this room as if you were right here in the room because you really are. Our hearts are with you there, and uh, we know you're there, and uh, we, we just want you to, to enter into everything that uh, God is doing in this room. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's a rare privilege that we have. Well, we, we have a lot of privileges to have a lot of uh, recognizable people in the kingdom of God come through this church because of the revival. And normally we don't give any special attention to any of those folks. We've had heads of denominations that have been here and you haven't known about it. Uh, we've had congressmen and senators and governors and, and uh, people of high position and so forth. And, and uh, we've never, never made a big deal of that and we still don't today. Uh, we've had some named leaders of Christianity come through here and a few of them occasionally they have been um, invited to speak from this pulpit but uh, by and large this revival is not about celebrity this revival is about we want to keep God central and we want to keep his glory central and uh, not that any of these folks would take any of that glory or they would touch it in any way whatsoever but we just don't want this to be a parade of celebrities we want Jesus to be the celebrity but occasionally there are folks that come through here that we we really feel that God uh, has appointed them to come here uh, to speak into our lives. And I want to say to you, friends, and say to anyone that may be watching, that, that we're not so uppity and we're not so uh, confident that we've arrived at anything that we won't let anybody speak into our lives. Listen, we're human. This treasure is in, in human, human vessels. And um, we, we want people to speak into our lives. And occasionally God sp sends people here uh, that we feel can speak into our lives. And the person that's going to come and talk to you for a few moments is a person uh, like this. Um, she's here of her own accord and volition. She came uh, at her own expense. And um, she came because there was a burden on her heart uh, to pray for this revival, for the leadership, and for this church. And um, was privileged last night to be in a, a prayer meeting with uh, her and some other people in the in the lounge, and um, I'm telling you, the power of God is in this lady's life. She um, uh, spent the night here, a Friday night, I believe it was, or Saturday, Friday night it was, the whole night in this facility, praying and interceding on behalf of the church and the leadership and the revival. And um, I'm telling you, folks, there are not a lot of people that will come in here and give of themselves like that. A lot of people come to get blessed, and that's good, and we want to bless folks. But she came to give. And uh, she's been a tremendous blessing to her. We've heard from her before. And uh, she's with us this morning. And uh, uh, Pastor and I were talking uh, last night about the service today. And um, he said, um, you know, just follow the leadership of your heart and the Holy Spirit. And just do what you feel like needs to be done. And so uh, I feel like this lady has something to share with us today. And I want you to be open and receptive. And um, if, um, if God so ordains... Uh, uh, she will just uh, do what uh, the Spirit leads her to do. And um, if she finishes in time, then I have a message that I'll share with you. If not, we'll go into communion. But we're just going to follow the leadership of the Lord this morning. Would that be okay with everybody? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. So would you welcome, please, uh, Su Suzette Houghton as she comes to... Uh... <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. Let's give a clap for Jesus. Come on, everybody, let's go. Yes, Lord. We give you all the glory, the praise, and honor this morning. You are worthy to be praised, our Lord and our Savior. We love you. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. We as your people adore you this morning. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For me, it's a wonderful privilege to be here. It was a bit unexpected. <laughs> But uh, I am honored to have the trust of the leadership to give me this time. And I said one thing to the Lord, I said this morning, I said, Lord, one thing you are teaching me here in this Brownsville, 
I better be ready in season and out of season. Because <laughs> I didn't expect it last time when I was here. We were actually just coming in for a holiday time. You know this three days you take off, off once in three years? That was it. And so Pastor Kilpatrick saw me. And he called me on the stage, and well, some of you were here then, and that was the end of the holiday time. <laughs> and uh, this time, though, it's true that I have come for a different purpose, and Pastor Kapatrick has asked me to share that with you. But let me just say this morning, first of all, how wonderful it is to know that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And as I'm going to share with you just one or two things this morning, I just want to say that yeah, you know, God is so good. And I remember when I went the first time to Toronto, that's where God showed me that dignity is not the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> and this morning when I was sitting over there, I said, God, my knees are having close fellowship. You better help. S-O-S. <laughs> so this morning I'm just going to share from my heart with you a few minutes why I really came. And I wasn't really planned to be here. Excuse me, but it was while I was actually in um, Australia on a tour. Now, many of you know that I have been working for uh, 16 years with Pastor Reinhard Bonke, and that's absolutely right. Though the beginning of this year, God led us in starting our own ministry, and so we are having crusades and so on and, and reaching out. And I was just touring Australia and also preparing there for the crusade we're going to have in Irian Jaya. Now, I had last... Sunday, you had somebody here from Irian Jaya. Well, we're going to join him in the evangelism. And uh, we are going, when we leave here, we are going to Irian Jaya. And they told me that I am going to have a crusade. And just 30 kilometers from where I will have the crusade, uh, there are still cannibals. Who wants to join? <laughs> so they said to me, Suzette, there are cannibals there. I said, well, if they get a hold of me, they've got breakfast, lunch, and supper. <laughs> but I said, uh, so I said, I promise you, while they are warming up the water, I'll preach a hot salvation message. <laughs> but while I was in Australia, actually, and uh, um, ministering there, one afternoon I was in prayer. And I was just praying for the meeting. And you know how God sometimes dropped these SOS things from heaven. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And uh, as I was praying, suddenly God burdened my heart with Steve Hill. Tremendous burden came upon my spirit. And I started interceding for him. Now, that was nothing unusual for me to intercede for people, but, but um, this was an extraordinary heavy burden. And I was praying and praying and praying and praying. And I was looking on my watch. I had to go and preach, but yet this burden wasn't lifting and I was really praying, and suddenly God spoke to me, and he said, I want you to go to Pensacola, and I want you to go and pray, and I want you to go and be a servant, and I want you to go and serve, and I want you to go and pray and intercede for the leadership and the church, and this is why I really hear, and that's what I'm going to share with you. In 1 Kings chapter 18, and people, I come this morning talking to a people who knows revival, who has seen God's flow who has seen God move in a wonderful way in the last three years. And truly, as I was coming in here last time, I was so blessed. But this time, as I was praying for, for Steve and for Pastor John and for the rest of the team and the people here, yes, it's true, we were in here on our faces praying here in the sanctuary for a few days. And uh, as I was praying, I said, God, what are you saying? Why am I really here? What am I to pray through? What am I here for? What are we to look for? And then God started talking to me about 1 Kings chapter 18. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see the story of Elisha. Now, last night when our brother got up here and he started talking about Elisha, I just smiled and so did a few of us from the intercession. Because you see, people, I believe it, that's exactly where we are standing at this time here if, uh, from my understanding of what God is doing here. And I see the story of a man of God who had a mandate from the Almighty. Yes. 
He heard from God. God spoke to him in verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 18, and the Lord said to him, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain. Amen. And here came this man of God. And what I so like about the whole story here is that I always used to think, wow, Elijah was a mighty, mighty bold man. I thought, what a man. I thought, Lord, one day in heaven, I want to give him three hugs. <laughs> Don't worry, I already made the appointment. But I thought, what a man to rise up like that until I saw how he ran away from Jezebel. I thought, oh, no. But then I saw, you see, people, it's not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And when I look at this here and I saw how Elijah, this man of God and the servant of God, acted upon the Word of God, he had a mandate, number one. He had orders from the Lord. He knew where to go. He knew what to do. And as he went and went to Ahab and showed himself, we know the story, and I'm not going to go into all the detail of that, how Elisha challenged the people. He challenged the backslidden Israel. Isn't that right? And he rebuilt that altar, and he put the whole sacrifice on that altar, and he challenged them to pour water over it. And then we see that Elijah prayed, and we know that the fire fell. Isn't that correct? And as the fire fell, people of God, that fire licked the dust, that fire licked the stones, that fire licked the water, that fire licked the sacrifice, that fire was purifying the whole thing. And what did the people say? The Lord, He is God. Amen. It's exactly what we see here in Brownsville. We see that the fire of God that has fallen here is challenging a backslidden church. We see that this fire that is falling here is challenging the lost. Yes, that is true. We see that the lost is coming through. Just listen to these wonderful testimonies. Yet, church, we have got people coming through here who are getting born again and people who are getting saved, unbelievers. Yet, we haven't seen the community come in yet. Amen. And God doesn't just want to bless a few. God wants the nation. Yeah. Hallelujah. And when I look at this, yes, I was interceding here. God started talking to me about that. And the Lord still showed me how this fire here is licking the dust in people's lives. It's licking the stones in people's spiritual lives. It's even leaking their, 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 now what do you call it in English? Their, uh, oh Lord, I need a word. Their religious waters. Amen. It's leaking the sacrifice in their lives and burning it, and it purifies. And the people come and they say, this is God. And the newspapers come and say, this is God. And those that are writing, those that are writing the articles the, on the TV and everything else, they say, this is God. And we say, this is God. But listen, are you ready for this? Are you ready? It is not the fire that was the promise. It's the rain that was the promise. It was not the fire that broke the drought. It's the rain that broke the drought. Amen. And I believe from what I understood from God in this time that we were interceding here. And what a privilege. What a joy. You know, they always say intercession. Listen, intercession, you don't have to be weird to be spiritual. Amen. Intercession is exciting. It's a blessing. Hallelujah. It commands the history of a nation. And I see here, it was the rain. But you see, people of God, without the sacrifice, without the altar, without slaughtering the bowels, I don't think that was so nice and sweet. I think it was mighty Mm, aggressive. 
Amen. I think that was quite action. And I think it's quite action when what we hear is, as Pastor Steve is, is uh, um, yeah, as he's preaching and challenging the people. Hallelujah. But people, there's a new dimension. I could come here this morning and I prophesy to you in Jesus' name. God is ready to spring in a new wave. <laughs> and what is this new wave? What do we, we hear about a new wave and a new wave? What is the new wave? Well, God is the God of new dimensions. And if we, you see, if we break through in God, either you go into the new dimension or you diminish. You can never stand still in God, never. Either you grow or you diminish. Isn't that right? Amen. And we want to go from glory to glory and dimension to dimension. And I see that that is a very clear spiritual principle. Also here for Elisha. As Elijah went up, after the fire fell, Elijah had the choice to say, let's build here a monument. Elijah had the choice to say, let's make an idol out of this. Elijah could have said, well, wow, what a manifestation. Elijah could have said, wow, fire, burning it all up. And Elijah, Elijah could have been distracted from the ultimate promise. He could have gone and have a party with Ahab, you know. But he didn't. Because this man knew that it was not the fire, but the rain. That God didn't just want those few that was at that altar and at that, yeah, that altar and saw the fire. That God didn't only want to touch them. God wanted to break the drought over a nation. And God doesn't just want those that come through here blessed as they are, thousands as they are, from different nations, from your nation, from this beautiful nation. God doesn't just only want the few that come through here, the thousands. God wants the nations. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen as thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth as thy possession. And so I see God wants the whole nation. He wants the communities. He wants to break the drought. So now as we look into what is then this new dimension, well, I, who am I to say it's just this or that? Who am I to try to box God in? Yet I believe if I understand the Lord right, and if my discernment is right, and may the Lord Jesus help me, then I believe that God is, God is ready to bring in this new wave. Yes, the focus shall be the lost and always be the lost. But I believe that the next wave God is going to bring into this church, I believe with all my heart from what I saw here on this carpet, that ambulances will drive up here and wheelchairs would be empty. I believe with all my heart, signs and wonders, is to flow in the next month in this church. And in the next months and in the next time as God is bringing this in, I believe the miraculous will flow. I believe with all my heart, people of God, that there will come a time. And yes, I prophesy this into this place this morning. I believe that the music will play and people will jump up perfectly healed. I believe that there will be prophecies. I believe signs and wonders is to come in. Thus says the Lord. Yes, we had the world take note. Yes, we had Pensacola on the map. Yes, we've seen what God has done. Yes, we've seen the wonderful works that God has done in your beautiful place. And yet I believe that was only the beginning. I believe that's only at the altar. People of God, I believe that the miraculous will break through, not just as big as, a, as a man, the cloud, as a man's hand, but I believe that God wants to use the miraculous to bring in the real lost. Yeah. Now, what do you mean with that, Suzette? The lost is here. Haven't you seen the altars every night? Oh, I sure did. Hallelujah. <laughs> I look at that and I think, devil, you are in trouble. <laughs> Amen. Say amen. amen. But you know, when Jesus hung on the cross, he hung there for a dying world. Hallelujah.
No, I'm not despising the one and the two and the three and the ten and the hundred thousand or the hundred and twenty thousand, the hundred and fifty thousand, how, however many that got saved here. Jesus does not despise the one when he was hanging there on the cross, dying for a dying world. Jesus took the time for one next to him. So we're not despising that. No, we bless God for every soul that find the Almighty God. But people, there are city after city in America that needs to hear this great gospel, that needs to see the glory of God. America needs to be saved. Africa needs to be saved. Europe needs to be saved. The nations need to come to the living God. And so how will that be? God has used signs and wonders, not for people just to get healed. No, we can still go to heaven with a sick body, but we can't go to heaven with a sick soul. Isn't that right? But I tell you this, the same blood that flowed for our salvation is the same blood that paid for our infirmities. By his stripes, we are healed. And so I believe that God wants to bring in the miraculous in the most amazing way. So that the lost, the community, everyone who would maybe now, they took note of Brownsville. But when the wheelchairs start emptying out and the, and the people come here on their stretchers and they start running and the lame leap like a deer, we will see the community come in and be saved. <laughs> and so... I ask myself many times, God is the God. Yeah. <laughs> I ask myself, I said, Lord, how shall this be? And as I was interceding, I said, Lord, I need to know what to pray. Because to pray something through is not a problem, as long as you know what God wants. And so as I was praying there, I was just thinking about God working in new dimensions. And God took Elisha and he went up and he put his head between his knees and he started praying. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. No, that manifestation was not there the first moment. No, that manifestation was not there. You know, I always say to the people, the answer of prayer sometimes comes like a jet plane and sometimes like a tortoise. But it's coming. And as Elijah was praying and crying out, and he continued because he knew that God has spoken. And what was the promise? Rain was the promise. God has spoken. Yes, he has given a, a visitation. He has given, he has given us the fire. He's licking the water in people's lives. But the promise of the Lord is not just the fire. The promise of the Lord is the latter rain. Hallelujah. The promise of the Lord is the cities, the nations. Hallelujah. So I ask myself now, that sounds all great and spiritual, but now you know, Suzette, <laughs> I said to the Bible school students when I was preaching there, I said, I grew up with five brothers. Well, I tell you, that was total survival, thank you. <laughs> survival training. You think I'm tall, you should see my brothers. If they were around in David's days, they would have thought they were Goliath. Like tall men. And so they helped me very much to be down to earth and very practical, which I'm thankful for now. I wasn't quite as impressed when I was younger. So I said, God, that's all great and spiritual, but how are we going to do it? And you see, people, I believe from if I understand the story of this place right, the first breakthrough was breakthrough by the body of Christ. And so will the second be. And I've come to encourage you. Yes, we've seen wonderful breakthroughs in Africa with Reinhardt. 
We've seen where our crusade starts with 10,000, well, really, 3,000, 4,000. When I joined the, uh, the team in 1980, it was 4,000, 5,000. But I tell you what, when we started including the whole body of Christ into intercession and prayer, we kicked from 10,000 to 75,000, to 150,000, to 300,000, up to a half a million people in a single meeting. Who prayed that through? Not me. God forbid that I would ever be that proud in my life to think that I prayed that through. Yes, I was in charge of the intercession. I was in charge of all the prayer preparations of all these projects we had. But I was just, I was just the, how would you call it, the catalyst, is that it? Really, the people who really prayed it through was the body of Christ. And I believe the same has happened here. I believe if we're going to take the nation's people of God, then we need everybody to pray together. And if I understand the word of God right, then I see in, 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 in Exodus chapter 17, we see how Amalek, how Israel fought Amalek. And I see, I see Moses in action. I see Aaron in action. I see her in action. I see Joshua in action. I see the whole Israel in action. And it has to be the same. Because when Moses' hands were high, the whole Israel was in victory. And when Moses' hands were low, the whole Israel was in trouble. But you said, you don't understand. You don't understand the pressure we are already here under. You don't understand the pressures we go through in this revival. The intense program, the difficulty to balance it between families and, 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 and revival life. And oh, my brothers, my sisters, I do understand. I do. Now, I'm not saying this is easy. I remember times in Africa, where in the meetings, how do you handle half a million people? And as we were out there, sometimes in the morning, five o'clock, when we woke up, there were already queues of people waiting at the, in front of the hotels to be prayed for. But I want to encourage you with this, and then I'm going to give back. I'm almost finished. I speak in fast forward, and you listen in fast forward, okay? I come to encourage you, and I asked the Lord, when, especially when I said I could take a bit more time than what I expected, I asked the Lord, what shall I say to these people? And I say to you the same thing that encouraged us again and again. And I come to tell you the God, who is the God of, of, yeah, of fresh dimensions, of new dimensions. God wants to take us from, from anointing to anointing, just like he took Elisha from the one place to Elisha to with a double portion. God wants to take us to the double portions. Amen. And what was the double portion from Elijah to Elisha? It was an increase of the miraculous double to the number. Amen. And what do I see? I wrote this down. I said, when I looked in Genesis, in Genesis, God chooses men. Adam, Abram, God chooses these men to fellowship with. In Exodus, God redeemed man out of bondage. In Leviticus, God was calling man. In Numbers, God was speaking to man. In Deuteronomy, God was commanding man. But in Joshua, God was conquering through man. And I believe that God has chosen us already. He has redeemed us already. He has called us already. He has spoken to us already. He is commanding us now and say, Arise, America, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And how? When I look at the Old Testament and I see how Moses was a man who walked in the miraculous of God. He saw signs. He saw wonders. He saw his, his own staff turn into a snake and turn back into a staff. Now, I, turned, I came from Africa. Hmm. We know about snakes. I don't think you Americans know about snakes. You know about snakes? You've got snakes here? Hmm. Well, I tell you what, no matter how smart you are, you meet a cobra and I want to see how fast you can become an Olympic runner. 
And here Moses had to face it. But Moses saw the red, uh, uh, Moses saw the, de- um, the red to open for him. But Joshua saw the life Jordan open. Moses' people ran from the enemy. But people, this is the rising generation. We're not running from the enemy. We face the enemy. Hallelujah. We're not going into the desert. We're coming out of the desert. We possess the land in Jesus' name. is the time to possess the land. Now is the time to take the land. This is our generation. The children of Israel. Oh Lord, I wasn't even planning on this, but never mind. The children of Israel, they remember. Those little kids, if you ask them, what do you remember? I think they will say, whoa, I saw the Red Sea open. We saw a cloud by day, and at night we saw a fire. But oh, if you ask Joshua's kids, they say, well, we had fruit to eat. We had the land, hallelujah. And I believe our former children, maybe they've seen a little bit of the glory of God. Maybe they saw a little bit of the power of God. The generation that's rising, we will see wheelchairs empty. We will see the lame run like a deer. We will see the blind see. We will see the lost being saved because God has promised it in Jesus' name. And so I see the God who give increase. And the moment Joshua, I like this, I like this. Can I just quickly add this in? Can I make a detour? How many of you are going to be angry with me? How many of you promise to, to, to continue loving me, even if I make a detour? You have to, the Bible says so. When Moses let the people out, he let people out that were in slavery. When Joshua took the land, he took a fresh generation. We're not in slavery. We are free in Jesus' name. And when I look at this, I see as Joshua conquered, the moment he went over the Jordan, what did he take? City after city after city after city after city after city. America will see the glory of God. City after city after city after city. Hallelujah. And how will it be? And I'm closing quickly with this in Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel, excuse me, in Daniel. I look at the man in Daniel and I see a revivalist. Isn't it? I see a man who turned a nation around. A man who faced the lions. Not only that. A man who influenced a nation in such a way that the king said, everybody bow the knee to the God of Daniel. Now to me, that's a revivalist. And I look at a man who knew what it was to pray. And I look at a man who knew what it was to worship his God. A man that knew what it was to pay a price. A man that knew what it was to suffer. A man that was in an ungodly, backslidden nation. A nation that didn't even want to know their God in many ways. And were among people that were compromising all the time. I look at a man who didn't want to control. No, he helped. He was wise. A man that that flowed in the gifts. A man that flowed in revelation. A man that flowed in wisdom. What a man. Amen. It wouldn't be bad to have Daniel on your team, isn't it? And then I see God worked with Daniel, and with this I want to close today. I saw God taking his servant from a place of sacrifice and a place, yeah, of facing difficulty and opposition. A man who had to learn to flow in his gifts, interpreting dreams, flow in wisdom. And God said, it's time to take you into a new dimension, Daniel. And people, that's what I want. We want more of God. We don't only want to be blessed. We want to see the lost being saved. 
We don't only want to see them come in as we see here, maybe by the hundreds until now. We want to see whole cities come to God. And I believe it's possible. And so God took his servant who knew what it was to bow down three times a day to pray. Open the window and worship his God. Man that knew what it was to rise up and make a stand for God. A man that lived clean, wouldn't even touch the ungodly things on the table of the king. And God said, Daniel, I want to use you more. But to use you more, I need to take you a step further. And I don't want to stay in the same place, and you don't want to stay in the same place. Isn't that right? And I see in Daniel, and I'm just quickly going to go through that. I see in Daniel chapter 8, how God spoke to Daniel in verse 18. And I see that God had to touch Daniel in four areas to get him ready for that new dimension that God had. And I believe that what God's going to do, I'm speaking this morning to the family of Brownsville, isn't it? And so I'm talking to you as family. You just have to love me funny accent and all. <laughs> but I look in Daniel chapter 8, and I see in verse 18 where it says, Now as I was speaking, uh, now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time. People, I believe that God is going to bring all the more a fresh touch. You've been so involved in this revival. You've been so involved in pouring yourself out and giving yourself. Hang in there, guys. Hang in there. Keep going. We're going to go from 100,000 to 200,000 to half a million. I've seen it in my life. If God can do it in Africa, God can do it in Brownsville. God can do it in America. In Jesus' name. And I believe that God is going to lift our eyes all the more to the horizon where the harvest is ripe. God is going to bring all the more a fresh touch of understanding. Please listen. This is of vital importance, and I believe it's prophetic into this church. I believe God is going to bring all the more the fresh vision. He touched me and gave him revelation. For Daniel to be used all the more in God, Daniel had to have even fresh revelation of the ultimate plan of God. Amen. I remember in my days when, when I was still leading Pastor Bonkers uh, crusades and I was in charge of all the intercession and the prayer. We were praying while he was preaching. We had a wonderful time. I love it. Man, prayer is action. Prayer is not boring. And, uh, and as I was praying there, God said to me, Suzette, lift up your eyes. And I always thought I could, God could never use me. What am I? I'm just a woman. And I said, God, you can't, you can't use me like that. And God starts speaking to me, especially about Muslim countries. God gave me, in, as, a, as a person in Voice in the City, amazing favor in Muslim countries. I preached crusade after crusade in Muslim countries. Open air crusades. Hallelujah. I've just been in uh, Manadu. In Manadu, we've had a wonderful crusade as I was preaching there. We had up to, by God's grace, up to 75,000 people in a single meeting. 27 Muslims filled in a decision card for Jesus in four days. 27 Muslims making a decision for Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Come on church, give a clap to Jesus. And so we see God move and lifting our eyes from where we are. And God will restore vision unto you people. And blessed as this revival is, what is the vision of God? The vision of God is the community, the whole community of Brownsville. God doesn't only want to touch a few. God wants Brownsville to be saved. Jesus paid for Brownsville. People, Jesus paid for the nations, and that's what's going to happen. So God's going to restore all the more vision, number one. Number two, I see here, the second place where he was touched, Daniel chapter 10, 
verse 10, and suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. Does that sound familiar? Yes. God is going to touch us even more. I think the worship here is absolutely wonderful. I think the worship here is wonderful and marvelous. But I tell you, church, we haven't seen anything yet. The days will come that as we worship that the Jekinah glory will come into this place and people will be touched 10 kilometers from here and 20 kilometers from here and 30 kilometers from here because Jesus is alive. Now I believe God is going to lead us. If I say us, I feel I can say almost us because I prayed as much for you this place this few days as you. And I see how God is going to take all of us, no matter if it's Brownsville, no matter if it's Germany, no matter if it's Argentina, no matter if it's Africa, no matter if it's South, uh, South America or North America, no matter if it's Asia. I tell you what's, what's going to come in the move of God in the nations now. God is going to restore the level of worship where the Jekinah glory will fill the place. And as the Jekinah glory filled the place, oh, we will just fall on our faces before him. I say worship. <laughs> worship is the best medicine against pride. There is no true worshiper that can have pride in his or her heart. Because the more you worship, the more you see who he is, the more you see who you are. The more you worship, the more you will feel his heart. People always come to me and they say, pray for me that I have a greater burden for the lost. I say, come here, come here, pray for you. I say, God make him a worshiper. And, and so, I see that God is going to, ooh, shakala rasanya. Power of God here. God's going to restore worship. God's going to restore worship in this assembly in a way we've never seen before. God's going to worship, bring worship into the nations. God's going to bring worship into your private lives. God's going to bring worship not just when we are together. I prophesy to you, God is going to stir you up in the middle of the night and make you worship until the glory of God will fill your room and save your family and heal your bodies and change your lives. And then I see his knees and his hands. He was touching worship and in prayer. And I've suggested to Pastor, to Steve and to the leadership, listen people, I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. I can only pray for them. They are the leaders, they decide. But I suggested that you as a people Take some time, two, three minutes. I know you are praying Tuesday nights. I know you pray Thursday night. But I suggest that you as a people, again, even in the midst of the revival meetings, take two, three, meet, three, two, three minutes or four minutes to come into real prayer and intercession for the next wave. And those nations that come in here by the hundreds and the thousands that are blessed here and receiving from the revival, they can join in in that prayer and sow so that they can reap. Amen. And let's all pray that new wave in. Let's all pray that new wave in. And then I see verse 16. And suddenly one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched my lips. And I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to the one who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me. That word sorrows there is actually the same word for travail or crying out or weeping. And what is God saying, people? I know what the Lord is going to do as God is restoring vision all the more. As God is restoring praise and worship, worship and prayer all the more. We're not just going to have an assembly talking to people. We're going to have 
thousands of evangelists out on the streets. Men and women taking the streets of America, taking the streets of Europe. Hallelujah. As the evangelists preach here, God's going to raise up young people by the thousands to go and preach in the pubs, in the homes, on the streets. Hallelujah. And the drug addict is going to come. And the prostitute is going to come. And I tell you, they will know that the glory of God is out there because God is going to touch his people's mouths to speak. When I was in Argentina, I met yesterday people from Argentina. Raina preached in the main crusade. But before the crusade, we took the young people. We had them praying, believe me. We made them work. And... Uh, as we were praying, because we believe to the level that we pray is the level we reach out. Don't tell me you are preaching for five hours and you pray for one. If you preach for five hours, you pray for five hours. And so as we, to the level that we pray was the level we took them out on the streets. We had 720. I had 720 young people with me on the streets of Argentina. I want to tell you something, people of God. We saw more salvations through the street work than what we saw through the main crusade. And those young men and those young women, they went out there and they preached to the people and they talked to them and they evangelized them. They found people on their way to commit suicide. They found drug addicts. They found prostitutes. They found professors. Hallelujah. God is going to open the mouth of his people with a boldness to evangelize the streets, the pubs, the hotels, everywhere. Hallelujah. And then the last thing. Let me just say this. I need to say this. I just picked up somebody's thought. Let me just say this to you, my brother. The anointing demands action. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. And much as this revival is here, and I believe there will come times that you'll put screens out there. People will come by the hundreds and thousands. But I also believe that God will take his people into the streets, out in the schools, everywhere, to preach the gospel. And the last touch I see is verse 19. And he said, one greatly beloved, <coughs> excuse me, Verse 18, and then again, one having the likeness of the man touched me and strengthened me. Strengthened me. The likeness of the man strengthened me. And in closing, I want to talk to you for one minute. You have been giving yourself, people. You've been praying. You've been serving. Can I tell you a small secret? When I was here last time, from there I traveled uh, at least once around the world since May I've been here, since May that I've been here. And I gossip about you everywhere. Everywhere. Don't know where he's now. Don't know where this dear brother is. But there was a brother always standing at this door. Elderly brother. Elderly brother with white, white hair. Always standing there. Don't know who he is. I told the whole world about this old man. He so blessed me. You know why? He served. I saw a man in the rightness of his life. In servanthood. Touched me. Touched me. I see you pour yourself out. I've seen you cry. I've seen you weep. I've seen the intercession. I see the youth. I see I had the privilege to get a little bit behind the scenes. I've seen you giving yourself. But the God who has chosen you for this work, for the altar now, has also prepared you for the rain. And the rain falls 
it soaks the ground. And he who will give you fresh vision, who will lift your eyes all the more into the nations, he who will touch you fresh in worship and prayer, he who will open your mouth to speak even more about Jesus and the authority of God everywhere, is the one who will strengthen you. This is what he said. He will strengthen you. Keep praying. Let's keep going. Let's run up the mountain. We're not on top yet. We still need to pray the clouds in. We still need to break the drought. Would you stand to your feet, please? I'm going to be <clears throat> asking if I just may once have the worship team, this, our pl pl player back, please. And I'm going to take this moment. I'm going to ask you to take hands right across this congregation. And I was so honored to come in for a few days here and just to serve just in the little bit that God allowed me to do. But you've been pouring yourself out now for almost three years. Or is it already three years? Going into the third year. And we don't want this revival to stop. Because the promise was not the fire. The promise was the rain. Amen. And Jesus is coming back soon. We don't know when. But we're preparing for him. And if he comes back, and we are ready, we go, whatever he's going to do. Or maybe we go to him, I don't know. But one thing we ask God, there is no reason why this revival has to stop. And we read through the centuries, revival after revival that stopped after a few years, or even after a few months for that matter. But there's no reason why it should be, people. Because Jesus paid for a dying world. Amen. And it's our job to plunder hell and to populate heaven. And he hell cannot be bigger than heaven. Or Satan will say, I've won after all. There's a world to reach. There's a lost out there. Let's pray in that next wave. Let's hold the target. Let's lift our eyes. The harvest is ripe. They are hungry. They are thirsty. There's a drought in the land. But God says, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. And right now we're going to just take hands. And first of all, I want you to pray for strength for the person next to you. Before we even pray for anything else, I ask you to pray for strength. Just open your mouth and let's just start worshiping God first and then pray for the person next to you for strength, strength, strength. Pray for strength. Pray for one another. Pray. Come on, people, pray for one another. Pray for those that be served. Come on, pray, pray, Kurabasaya. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your strength flow. Let your fire flow. Let your power flow. Come on. Flow, fire of God. Flow, fire of God. Flow, fire of God. Flow from them. Revive them this morning. Strengthen them this morning. Let a fresh fire of God come upon them this morning. Spirit. 
Somehow, God has touched a man in this meeting with multiple sclerosis. On to the left is a man that has pain with problems in his chest. God has healed you the moment we were worshiping. The Lord spoke to me about a couple in this meeting who can't conceive. You are sitting right there on to the back. God says you'll have a boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now I want us to pray one more time. I want us to sing the song one more time, and I'm going to do it this way. I want us just to take one minute and I'm going to ask everybody in the balcony, I want you to pray only for the ministry team, only the ministry team, the revival team. I want you to pray for them. And I want we're going to do that way, but I want you to pray that God strengthen them because you know, to pray in a new way takes, takes power. But Elijah, Elijah, excuse me, was running up that mountain in supernatural strength. And that's what we're going to pray. An inspiration of supernatural strength like they have never seen before. In Jesus' name. Yes, you up on the balcony, is that okay? Yes, you over here, up into this middle. Let's make an aisle here. In the middle here, this aisle, and all of you this side, I want you to pray for that new wave to bring in the lost like never before. That America and the nations will come by the thousands and the millions. Why not millions in Jesus' name? And all of you this side, I'm going to ask my brothers to pray. These brothers are... Oh, chapel, please forgive me. I'll pray for the chapel. Chapel... I'm going to ask you to pray for the glory of God into the churches of America. I want you to believe God, for they will arise, every preacher, every preacher in the nations to come under the glory of God. And you over the side, we're going to pray here. We're going to pray for the miraculous. Bones to crack and to grow and blind eyes to open. Pastor, would you please pray with this group of the miraculous? And I'm going to pray with the lost over. No, I said I'm praying with the, with, the, with the chapel. Please forgive me. You over here, my brother, you over here, you pray with them. You pray for the lost. Hallelujah. Chapel, the glory of God. Raise your voice now. Come on, go.
excuse me, excuse me, excuse me for stopping you. People, if ever I lead, if ever you are the place where I lead prayer, we pray the word. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. And I want to say that if you're going to sing that song, the Lord reigns, you must know what comes out of your mouth has power. Yeah. Amen. And the Bible says, he has, made the, your, he has made his words a fire in your mouth. Now, I want you to sing that song, but I want you to sing it like a prayer and a declaration over this nation. Come on, do it with authority, do it with power. Sing from your spirit in authority to the spirit realm. Love. I think the devil is in trouble. I think the devil is in trouble. Amen. Many of you will find that from today on, God will wake you up in the middle of the night to pray. Many of you will find that from today on, God will give you a greater vision and a burden for the nations than what you've ever had. Many of you will find that from today on there will be a complete increase of worship and prayer in your own life. Yes, you've prayed this revival in, but there's a nation to pray in. Yeah. Amen. And many of you will find that from today on you're able to speak with a far greater boldness for Jesus. 
How can you say that to us? Is that we are in a revival? Oh, my dear. There's a nations to bring in. Out on the streets there in Jesus' name. And many of you will find that those of you that were weary and tired, that God will give you an extraordinary strength. It was wonderful to be with you. God bless you. Isn't it amazing and isn't it wonderful that God knows exactly what we need when we need it? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And God's been so gracious to this congregation to grace us with people like uh, Suzette that come in from time to time with a word from the Lord for us to uh, give us that, uh, that uh, bump that we need to keep us uh, on track and keep us going. And I appreciate so much you sharing with us today and the message that you brought to our hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we'll see that uh, Pastor and Steve get a copy of this so that, uh, that they'll be aware of uh, what God has spoken to us as a people. And we receive that with gladness, don't we? Hallelujah. 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 And the wonderful thing about it is, friends, uh, that we've, uh, we've heard through this message today is that uh, the, we, we've just begun. We've just begun to scratch the surface. You see, a lot of us, we come to the conclusion after we look at the figures and we've been now going into our third year, we think, well, you know, we've pretty much arrived. We haven't arrived. We haven't even, we've just begun to scratch the surface. There are hundreds of millions of people around this world that need the touch of God and need revival, and God's going to send that revival. And uh, this is the last day, and God said He was going to do it. And we're living in the most exciting time in the history of the church. This is a time for us to gird our loins about, put on our sandals, get our faces fixed, and make up our mind to go on with God and serve God with all of our heart and let every distraction fall by the wayside. Every detractor, we don't listen to that. We just, uh, we just gird our loins up, and we just suck it up, as we used to say in sports. And we go on. This is the fourth quarter. And we're down to about two minutes to play. The two-minute warning's already been given. And, friend, this is the time when the people who are in shape are going to win the game. They're going to win the contest right here. Those that have conditioned themselves win at this point in any athletic condition, uh, uh, in any athletic competition. They win. Those that have conditioned themselves, they win when everybody else is worn out. I believe we just about worn the devil out. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 One of these days soon, the trump of God's going to sound. And uh, those of you that are weary and you think you can't go one step farther, you're going to say, hey, I'm glad I took that last step. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to have communion in just a moment. And so the, uh, the uh, deacons are going to come. Our deacons are going to serve you. We have such a wonderful group of uh, godly men that serve this church. There are 25 of them. They'll be joined by some ushers and uh, in order to expedite things. And you may be seated right now. I think it'd be easier for them to serve you as you're seated. I'm going to ask Mike and the worship team to lead us in a song while we're dispensing the elements. And uh, after he has dispensed the, after we've gotten the elements dispensed to everyone, what we're going to do then is we're going to, uh, we're going to give anybody in here the opportunity, anybody in here who's lost the opportunity to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So, friend, if God's spoken to your heart already, and I believe God's spoken to every heart in here, you go ahead and take the elements. You might have said, well, I, I, I wasn't, I'm not going to take uh, communion because I have things in my life. We're going to give you an opportunity to clean that up. You know, Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians, when he's talking about the communion, he says, let a man examine himself and then eat. He didn't say let a man examine himself and abstain. He said, let a man examine himself and then eat. What he meant by examining himself is this, that if there's anything in your life that stands between you and God, if there's any sin in your life that would hinder God's perfect flow through your life, you need to examine yourself, get that squared away, and then you're capable of eating of these elements. 
Friend, if you're not willing to examine yourself, then you do need to ex abstain. You do need to, to let the elements pass you by. But if you're willing to take a good, close, hard look at your life and uh, come clean with God, then you take the elements and you hold them. And in a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to pray a prayer with us. And we're going to get the sin taken care of in your life. And then you'll be eligible to partake with us in this wonderful time. If you're not a member of this church, you're welcome. If you call Jesus Lord, then we call you our brother or sister. You take the elements. It's an open communion. And uh, you may join us. You do not have to be a member of this church. They're going to lead us in worship right now. So keep your heart and mind on the Lord as you receive these elements, uh, which are represent the... the crucified body in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This is a precious moment in the life of the body of Christ. Worship Him.
your God in three Is there anyone who has not been served? If you would, please raise your hand. Anyone in the chapel? I'm going to ask everyone in this building and in the chapel to stand with us at this time. There are those of you in this room, you have sat through this whole service and you felt like a stranger. You felt like uh, you didn't belong here, yet God in His providence brought you here, and so you were ordained to be here today. And God didn't bring you here by accident, friend. God brought you here by design. And He brought you here that you might be in the presence of His Son and that His Holy Spirit might be able to speak to your heart and that your life may be changed and transformed. None of us will leave the service like we came. We'll all be changed. Friend, if you have sin in your heart and your life, if you don't know the Lord today, if you've been a person that's just been going through the motions as a Christian, you're Christian in name only, not in practice, not in faith. You're a person that once lived for God or, and, and you've allowed things to come into your life that have uh, taken you away from God. And, uh, you know, I, I just... Sh sh I just uh, shake sometimes when I hear people say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm just not walking with the Lord right now. Friend, you cannot anymore be a little bit a Christian than you can be a little bit pregnant. You're either saved or lost. And if, you're, if, if there's sin in your life and you live a life of sin, why don't you just come clean with it today and just get it out of the way? Stop living in that lukewarm state, that state between the things of God and the things of the world where you're dabbling in both. Just get that under the blood today. We're going to say a prayer together in just a moment. And I trust that you will just release that thing and get it out of your life and you'll make a total, complete commitment to Christ. One of the things I was going to talk to you uh, about today was being convinced. Being convinced. Paul said, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to His purposes. That's in Romans 8. And I was going to talk to you about being a conqueror. And I was going to talk to you about being confident. And uh, maybe I'll do that at another time. But friend, one of the things that you need to do if you're going to follow God is make up your mind. A double-minded person, James said, is unstable in all of his ways. You hear that word, unstable. 
means that you can't be depended on. You, don't, you have no basis, no foundation upon which to build your life. It's, un, it's like building on sand. Because you're this way one day and that way another day. You want to serve God one day, but you want, to, you want the world the next day. Make up your mind. Be convinced about something for a change. And receive Christ today. Be convinced that you can live for Him. Some of you in this room, you've lost your confidence that you can even live for Him because you've gotten involved with things in your life and Satan has told you, you see there, there's no hope for you. But friends, God is a God of the second chance. God was in the recycling business before anybody ever thought of it. God was in that business. And so you can live for God. You can serve God. You can be victorious over sin. So I'm going to ask you today, are you in this room and you don't know the Lord or there's sin in your life and you've backslidden away from God or you're depending on some religious affiliation or some religious activity to, uh, to get you into the kingdom of God and you know and you've been convinced today that God has spoken to your heart and that you need to make a change. And if you want to pray today and right now, there's sin in your life, lift your hand and say, I want to be included in this prayer. We're going to say a corporate prayer together. We're not going to call you down here. So lift your hand all over the room. Get it up high. Be honest with God. Be, be, just be open with Him. He sees your heart anyway. Everyone with your hands lifted now and everyone with your hands down, we're going to pray together this prayer. Dear Jesus, Thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for bringing me to this service today. Thank you for what my ears have heard, what my spirit has received. There's sin in my life, Lord, and sin separates. You came to die for the sins of the world, Lord, and I want to receive forgiveness today. Therefore, I confess my sin, and I repent of that sin, and I turn away from it. No more will I serve that thing. Goodbye, Satan. Hello, Jesus. I'm going with you, Lord, from this day forward. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for receiving me into your kingdom. And now I receive you into my heart. And I confess you as my Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, friend, that was a very simple, short prayer, but it doesn't take long prayers to get God's forgiveness. Samson just prayed a short prayer, Lord, remember me. The thief on the cross just prayed a short prayer, Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. It doesn't take God long because, you see, God looks on your heart. And when you pray with sincerity, and when you pray with a desire to serve God, God honors that. And God's forgiven you now, and your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And guess what? Every one of those sins that you indicated when you lifted your hand, God has suddenly just forgotten every one of them. He hit the delete button on the computer, and it dropped every one of your sins. If you were to go out that door back there and say, God, do you remember that sin for which I raised my hands? God's going to go, nope. And it's not because he has a bad memory. It's because he chooses to blot it out of his mind. It's as if it never happened. Friend, you're as new right now and as fresh in God's sight as the day that, that you came out of your mother's womb. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, all the crud just went down the drain. It was all gone. Now listen, you need to get anchored in a good local Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Stop hopping around. Stop looking for the perfect church. There isn't one. You get anchored down in a, in a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, and you follow the Lord in baptism as a believer. Baptism in water by immersion. You begin to serve God. You begin to read your Bible, begin to pray, begin to witness. I'm telling you, friends, I, I, I can foresee just God spoke to my heart while Suzette was preaching a moment ago and God se seemed to say to me there are going to be more people saved outside of this church than inside 
I believe that God's going to put it in our hearts to take this message into this community, into not only the Brownsville community. We're just reaching out right here right now. This is the place where we start. But I believe that God is going to send us as ambassadors to every nook and cranny, every street, every alley, every business of this city, and more people are going to be saved outside of this building than inside. I'm, I'm just believing that we're going to see a steady stream of people that come in here every night that have already made a decision for Christ, but they're coming forward to make it public. And we're going to, I'm looking for the day that we have to baptize every single night. In fact, in fact, we may even have to extend revival to Monday night just to do baptisms. That's what I'm believing. I, I, I just believe in baptism that, that strongly. And so, friend, get on with following the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you, you're part of the family. And what we're doing right now is a family matter. It's not, this is not open to everybody. Not everybody is invited to this supper. Just those of us who have faithed the Lord Jesus Christ. So now you're welcome at the table. Friend, I want you to know that what you hold in your hand is precious there are all kinds of theological positions about what the communion means uh, you know but I just want to tell you that what what the communion means to me is this this represents a body that was crucified for me this represents a body that took all of my sicknesses and all of my sins upon that body and he did that because he wanted to do that Paul said while we were dead in trespasses and sin think about that friend you didn't deserve it and God didn't wait until you deserved it to send Jesus to the cross and Jesus didn't say well Lord when they shape up and they get good enough then I'll go to the cross but when you were dead in trespasses and sin Christ died for you that's what Paul said friend I want you to know that this bread represents the crucified body of Christ and upon that body was heaped every sin and every sickness that has ever been known in the history of mankind right up to this very moment and even into the future should Jesus tarry. Everything was taken care of on the cross. And after this body, or as this body was being crucified, blood began to flow down. Crown was put on his head. Pressed into his scalp, the thorns went in and hit the skull they were, they were some, some people believe they were three inches long or longer. Hit the skull, came out the, 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 the skin in another place, and blood began to gush down. You'll bleed more from a scalp wound than any other wound in your body. I know because I stuck my head through the windshield of a car in a wreck one time, and I, I just covered an overcoat that I had on with blood. My wife took one look at me, and she fainted. When she saw me, just blood everywhere. Just from a, a, about a th three or four inch gash up here. Just blood everywhere. And when they pressed that into Jesus' brow, see, he, the sin and the sickness was upon him. And now they press the, 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 the thorns into his brow and the blood begins to flow down to cleanse all of that stuff that's been placed upon him. The blood began to gush out of the, 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 the uh, wounds in his hand, in his feet, in his side. And that blood fell down from Calvary, ran into the earth, and it's run down through the centuries. And now 2,000 years later, that blood covers and washes every one of us from any sin that we've ever committed because of what he did in his body and through his blood on Calvary. We're going to pray God's blessings now upon this element, which represents his sacrifice. I want you to hold it up. This is, a, this is a reverent moment. This is precious. Father, would you take this bread and would you bless it as we ingest it into our system and would you make this a spiritual food to strengthen us in a way we've never been strengthened before. God, the weakest individual in this room right now, let strength flow into them. The strongest individual in this room, let strength flow into them. And all of those in between, those two extremes, Lord, let strength flow into them as we eat this, this flesh, as we ingest into our bodies the crucified Christ. Lord, we thank you because you were willing to die for us. 
We thank you because you suffered excruciating pain and humiliation beyond anything we could possibly understand as modern people. But, oh, God, give us a revelation of that as we eat today. And let that revelation speak to our hearts. And let that revelation change our very lives. And we thank you for doing that in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone eat together. After Jesus had broken the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. The Bible says he took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. God's written another chapter, friend. The devil said, It's, it's over. I've captured mankind, and they belong to me, and they're going to hell with me. But Jesus said, No, I'm going to take my blood, and I'm going to use it as ink, and we're going to write another chapter. This is the new covenant in his blood. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death. Friend, remember, remember, there was a terrible price paid for our sins. And we, we need to understand that as we commit ourselves to him afresh and new today to fulfill the vision that God has given us, prophecy that God has given us today. We need to be holy. We need to be pure. We need to stay humble. And we need to give him all the glory because everything we are, or everything we ever will be or anything we ever accomplish is not because of human ingenuity or human ability, but it's because of Him. It is really not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Everyone hold the cup up and say, Jesus, I remember. Let us drink. Jesus, I thank you for this blood. As we've ingested it, Lord God, may every impurity of our life be dealt with at this moment in time. May our strength be renewed. May our eyes be clear. May our purpose be set from this day forward. God, let us walk in the path that you've set before us. Let us not deviate to the left nor to the right. Let us not be moved by human opinion. Let us keep our eyes steadfast and sure upon you and the goal that you've set before us. And let us run this race with patience. And God, I pray now your blessings upon your people. I ask that you would bless their rising up and their lying down. They're going out and they're coming in. I ask you to make your face to shine upon them and give them grace and peace. May everything their hands find to do prosper. May their lives be rich and full and free. May health overtake them and may strength come into their lives. May their families be blessed. May their children be saved. May they prosper in everything they do. May the blessings of God be upon your people now and forevermore, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.